<laughs> so Chris, are you ready? Let's do it. All right, cool. So this is how we jam facilitating a workshop from start to finish here at Figma. We're going to talk a lot about Fig Jam today. I'm going to give some insights. Chris is going to give some insights. And, and Krista, would you like to uh, uh, introduce yourself? I would love to. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today, whether it's your morning coffee or your afternoon uh, you know, beverage. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Krista, a user experience researcher here at Figma. And this is a true dream for me to be alongside Miggy. I've already learned so much in just the preview I've gotten of his presentation. So excited for all of you to hear that. Um, but this is really the, my favorite part of my job is facilitation. And when I first started out as a user experience researcher, this was by far my biggest area of growth and something that really intimidated me the most. Also facilitation just in general is an area I'm always actively looking to improve. I'm basically just like throwing myself in random meetings just to like practice and hone in on that skill set. So it is one of those areas that takes a lot of practice and just like learning how to embrace different personalities in the room and situations that will inevitably happen really make you and refine those skills of being a facilitator. So ultimately, we're just hoping that by sharing our own experiences and tips for utilizing all of what's at your fingertips with amazing Fig Jam, you'll be, you'll be able to wear that like facilitation hat a little bit more confidently. Um, so brace yourself, this might get a little meta, we'll be like facilitating in, in Fig Jam, uh, but I'm excited. So kicking it back to you, Maggie. All right. So a little bit about myself. I'm Miggy from Figgy, Miguel Cardona. I'm a designer advocate here at Figma for Figma for Education. In my previous life, I've been a professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology. I see some of my former students in the chat, which is great to see you. RIT represent. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Miggy. I like to talk about education and Figma and design and user experience. And that's actually going to take me right into my presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to talk a little bit about workshops as a form of UX storytelling. So even if you're unfamiliar with the notion of UX, what we're fundamentally doing here is thinking about crafting a user experience when you are performing a workshop. So when you're designing it, when you're facilitating it actively, right, you're basically taking someone from the beginning to the end of a story, right? You're trying to collectively accomplish a goal. Okay, so thinking about that, right you guide your audience by answering some very simple questions at different phases of the workshop so if you think about the beginning the middle and the end first you're just like what are we doing here then what are we trying to do to complete our objective so if you're an educator you're trying to get through a class a lecture you know maybe you have a brainstorming session with your team maybe you're doing a retrospective right so what is the activity and this can be many activities and what are you providing for your audience to allow them to accomplish their goals and how are you accomplishing it together so after that what did we accomplish how do we evaluate it? And then at the very end, which is often overlooked when you're doing a presentation, what do we do next, right? So I wanna emphasize that part as well. And the way that I see this, and if you're a student of mine, you've probably seen me use the metaphor of like this narrative story arc, but this is totally like a narrative arc where you have in a story, the sort of exposition where you lay out, you know, what the scene is, who are the characters, you have the rising action where, you know, the activities getting done, you know, but before the rising action, you have this inciting incident, which, you know, it kind of kicks everything off. There's going to be a peak where the resolution is kind of in sight. You have the falling action, you have the resolution, and then the denouement where, you know, things kind of get wrapped up, right? The knot is untied. So taking a look at that, let's start to break down and see what that really means. So when I'm thinking of the exposition, you have to welcome your audience. You're facilitating an experience. You're thinking about setting the stage. You have to have something there. You need to be clear, concise. Maybe you have a simple icebreaker, right? Having an agenda would also be key. This agenda right here can actually be found over here in the stickers. And if you type in agenda, there you go. Boom. Agenda. You could just grab that, drop that right onto your stage. So that's actually something I prepared. So hopefully you like it. Ask your audience if they need accommodations. Make sure you're making the appropriate considerations. So this workshop can be virtual, in person. Ensure that your audience needs what they uh, has have what they need ahead of time. 
So this would be the way that I might set the stage for one of my workshops where I might be welcoming individuals to work to Fig Jam. So here I have Vanessa is joining with me. I might talk about some of the ways that I expect them to collaborate in the space. So I can press the E key, right? I can drop some stickers. So click stamp, 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 stamp. I can just drop stamps in the space. And the thing is, is you want to think about the interaction that they may be performing. So if they're trying to, ooh, I also got a little bit of a high five there. Oh, hey, right? So you see the cursor chat, the emotes. How do you want your audience to interact with you? Make sure you provide some sort of guidance. So I normally put this directly on the stage. One thing that is often overlooked is if you're using a virtual whiteboard like Fig Jam, how are you navigating that space? So how do you pan? How do you zoom in? How do you zoom out? You can't assume that your audience might be an expert in the, the software or the, the whiteboard that you're using. So provide some of that instruction. So then that way you feel comfortable and confident in what it is that they're doing, right? So then let's take us to the inciting incident, right? So this is an event that sets kind of like the main characters along on their story, right? So introduce the main activity or activities, right? What is the core objective? What are you aspiring to get done? Provide as clear instruction as possible, right? So introduce those interactions. I already kind of meant, uh, uh, identify that before. You need to kind of model the behavior that you want them to do. Um, I always stress using the imperative mood. So draw write, respond, vote. You want to eliminate any ambiguity of what is expected of your audience members, right? So you want to be as clear as possible when they're going through that. So let's talk about that in this space. So here I have uh, kind of like wayfinding elements, right? So I'm guiding my audience through this space, right? So I'm saying, okay, we're in the create portion of this where I want them to use market tools to draw and describe feelings about how things are going right now. I will also leave kind of uh, items on the canvas. And by the way, these are available in Figma community. You can go and look up Fig Jam tips and find these little tips that you can copy and paste into your own files. Um, so here I might remind myself to set a timer. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh, okay, I need to set about a 10 minute timer because I need to provide Krista time to talk as well. So I'm going to set that timer. I'm going to tuck it away and I'm going to see that there. And that's good too. So make sure you set yourself little reminders on the stage and that it's appropriate and understandable as you're moving through. I like to go top left to bottom right, but whatever is going to be most comfortable for your audience is going to be ideal. So we see that, oh man, I got Georgia in the file, I got Louie in the file, and got Kristen. So we're having a good time. We're performing the objective. I'm using a pretty simplistic example, but still this type of engagement, you know, needs to be facilitated. If you have a completely blank canvas, and are asking people to like draw, they might not know where to start or where to begin. So try to facilitate that as much as possible with that inciting uh, incident. So next we have the rising action. This is where people are just getting into the activity. They're doing all the things. Make sure that on your canvas, you have wayfinding to assist your audience, right? Think about those who might be coming in late. You know, are there multiple entry points for them to jump in and follow along where everyone is at, right? Assist those who may need it, provide space, time, and you might have to adjust things as they come up. There might be uh, adjustments. People might be really into an activity. So make sure you bake an extra time while they're performing these activities. And, and these sorts of workshops, uh, Samar, uh, basically I'm just kind of outlining in general. This is the way that I just like to structure. So whether I'm teaching a class or running a team workshop on a design sprint, right, this is the overall structure and the approach that I might have for it. So here I'm thinking about another example where I have collage. So I'm providing resources and like simple instructions. So then that way, if someone is coming in late, right, they still can get a sense of what they need to do. So there's once again, the way finding they know that we're in this spot they will see the cursors they will aspire towards that and they're in this kind of thinking creative space where it might be a little bit of chaos people are creating stickies people are dropping in like little diagrams we're working together in a space to kind of collaborate and get a sense of what it is that we're trying to accomplish by the way these examples i have here Junk Kaiju in the community and Pet Rock Jam. This was actually made by Kate Charinga, a designer at Spotify. So make sure you check those out. So these are other kind of like workshop examples, actual workshops that I've ran. Um, 
And I think that you can find them a little bit inspiring in the way that you can craft your own. So thinking about the peak, sometimes referred to as a climax. So time's up, time to review. Do we need more time? This is going to be the pivotal point where you go from uh, kind of like doing to kind of reviewing, right? So you're going to transition your audience. So you need to communicate your audience to your audience the next set of instructions. So then this way they know what it is that they're doing. Once again, you eliminating the ambiguity, right? You're transferring mindsets. Sometimes you might go to a different space on the canvas. Sometimes the space where you are just performing the activity then transforms. So let's take a look. So here, this is, oh, this that's the peak example. So that's the things kind of going in. Uh, here we go. Do, 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 do. Uh, so yeah, so here's the peak, right? Uh, everything's all set, right? It's good to go. You start to see the conclusion, right? The resolution is in place. We went from having objects that are like all over the place to kind of coming together. This is my junk kaiju example, as I mentioned, where we just have a bunch of random images from Google Images that are being constructed in a way to, to, to kind of have a little bit of more creative spark. Um, and then what we're gonna do is then move on from that point and have the falling action, right? So after you kind of see everything putting together, you transition over, you're gonna review what you have done, right? You're gonna organize, you're gonna curate, right? You're gonna discuss as a group, right? What are the learned things? So if you're doing a retrospective, there's a bunch of stickies on your page, right? Um, what are you doing and, and what is of value and, and what are the best ideas? So this is the curation phase. It shouldn't be overlooked, right? You don't just want people to dump a bunch of stickies. You want them to, to kind of discuss, you know, what's working, what's not. And in this phase, things are still a little bit malleable. You're dropping plus ones, you know, you're doing some, uh, you know, some like emojis. You're kind of going one-to-one -one on what people have observed, the way that they engage and how is that being developed. And with this example, you know, it's kind of coming together. It's not quite yet there. So moving on to the resolution, you might think like, well, I mean, didn't we just resolve everything after discussing it? Thinking about this as an intentional point where, you know, like, hey, it's over. Did we win? Was it successful? This is a time where you really evaluate the activity as a whole, right? So you move on from discussing the stickies that people have dropped, right? You move on from discussing uh, everything that you have. And as a facilitator, you say, okay, you know, this is good, or do we need to um, kind of examine something a little bit more? The resolution, you're gonna highlight kind of like the themes that have arisen in your workshop. You want to highlight those and you also want to open the floor for questions. You might also take the opportunity to share the floor for final thoughts. So if you have a retrospective, you know, you reviewed everybody's sort of comments, you know, you're evaluating at this point. So you've already done a bit of curation and now you're evaluating. So what this might look like, oh, Actually, we're going to hop over to the denouement. I like to group these together because they're often considered the same thing. So the denouement, uh, it means to untie the knot, and I apologize if I completely brutalized that French. Um, basically, what you're going to do is you're going to outline the next steps and the additional actions, right? So here in the denouement, you want to untie the knot. Right. You need to unfurl the activity that you just did. Right. You need to identify what are next steps. Who's going to be responsible for what you're going to create a to do list. Oftentimes, if you just end the activity and you move on, many of you have probably been in that situation where you're just like, oh, OK, it's over. Now what? You know, and when you leave it in that way, people may not know what they're responsible for, what they have to do as a teacher. The way that I see this is assigning homework. Right. And once again, this is an opportunity to use that imperative mood. Right. Be very specific on what people are uh, going to have required of them beyond this. So if you're providing a retrospective for your team, what is then actionable by your team? So provide follow up resources, export, share the board, and I can show you how to do that, too, uh, with a few examples. So when you're concluding it, right, these would be kind of like sort of the res resolution where you're commenting, you're evaluating. I'm going to press the C key. I'm going to leave a comment uh, right there. So, you know, this one is great. Right. And that's probably not very actionable feedback. But what you're seeing here is you're going to evaluate those final bits. Right. So things have been curated a bit. Um, so like, you know, even here, you might even move some things around. Uh, so like I'm moving like little stickies around. Right. You're readjusting and you're going to evaluate that. 
going to open the floor for questions as well. So ask a question, drop some stickies. Once again, always try to kind of highlight what you want people to do. If you say, hey, leave some feedback, that's too ambiguous. Or ask a question, that's too ambiguous. Show them how you want to ask a question. So ask a question, drop a sticky. And Louis here is saying, can we make it pop? <laughs> That's great. So once again, uh, the dental mall provide resources here. I have a bunch of those resources made available. These are in the community. This file we will share. Um, I have a number of different examples. So these are the fig jam tips. If I click on that, oh, it actually won't show up for y'all. It's opening up in my browser, but the fig jam tips will have all of those little cards that you can use in your instruction. Here is Kate's pet rock jam. This is a, a workshop on facilitating user research. Um, many of these can be found in the template section. Uh, so if I type in, let's say diagram, right? Let's say we're going to do a group diagramming activity. Uh, let me press enter. Oh, it's not coming up. Clear that. Oh, here we go. So here they are. So flowcharts. I'm sorry, it's flowcharts. So here's like a flowchart example. If you're going to do a group diagramming activity, you can pull up one of these templates. These templates will be put directly into your document, but you can also search the community, figma.com slash community. Um, and then you can review next steps. I have these stickers here that allow you to just kind of like create a simple to do list. So I could even say if something has been removed or added. Uh, once again, those can be found over here in the stickers. And also, you know, just remember to leave Tom for humanity, for community, you know, make sure that you leave a selfie, right? So this is a widget. And with the widget, I'm going to go ahead. I don't think Oh, it's not letting me use my camera, unfortunately. But can somebody else, Vanessa, can you drop a selfie? I already dropped a selfie in there earlier. I'm using a new browser window, so I would have to do all those settings. I'm not going to bore you with that. Boom, Vanessa, thanks for showing up. So have that point where you have a little bit of community, you kind of let people know, tie it up, loose ends. Uh, lastly, you can also export. So I'm going to select these items. And if I'm going to export that selection, you'll see that to make that actionable, I can export this as a PNG, a JPEG, PDF, or a CSV if it's sticky notes. So you can also copy sticky notes, paste them as Asana tasks. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity to make your fig jam um, more accessible. All right, I'm just out of time, but what I'm going to say here is that this is my facilitation arc. It's totally a thing and not something I made up last night, right? Uh, I might have just copied the concept of narrative arcs as a presentation device, but I think it works, right? So welcome, provide instructions, perform activity, transition, discuss, evaluate, provide next steps. I think it's it's fundamentally the way that I structure all of my workshops and hopefully you all will find some value in how I jam. So once again, I represent figma.com slash education. Figma is free for educators and students. Uh, I would like to take this moment to hand it off to Krista. Uh, also to drop a little bit of props to uh, Imen Sinani for his awesome flyover plugin, which I use to navigate my page, as well as Ellen Lupton's Zana storytelling by which, you know, this probably wouldn't have been possible. Krista, take it away. That was incredible and your timing was impeccable. Um, let's see what I can do with that. Um, hi, everyone. Let me get my screens together. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Do, do, do. Um, awesome. OK, so needing to plan that narrative arc, like Miggy just so eloquently uh, went through for all of us, is really critical for facilitating that successful workshop that we all wanna have, right? But sometimes, even though you think you thought through all the little details, an oh no situation is going to happen in the middle of your workshop or meeting. And so I'm gonna take an educated guess here. It's kind of my job to do that. And just to assume that this is what kind of keeps us up at night. This might give us the most anxieties of, of actually wanting to facilitate a meeting is like these unknowns that might pop up. Um, but it's kind of cool, right? We're in a group we're of just humans and that's bound to happen. And so we have some helpful solutions. We're not gonna leave you hanging with those. Um, and so what I really want you to walk away with today is just to remember that the more prepared you are with these alternative paths beforehand, the easier it will be to pivot in that moment when an oh no situation happens. And there's also just not one right way to handle any one of these situations. I'm gonna give you a few, but it's 
it, you, you're going to want to make it your own. It's all about just how you adapt and show humility in that moment. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk through uh, three different uh, scenarios that might happen as you're trying to improve one of these areas. So we're going to start with a big one, participant engagement. I'm going to do a big reveal moment because I love a reveal. Um, so you're wanting participant engagement, but things are quiet when you actually want them to be dynamic. So uh, have you ever been in, or facilitated a meeting or workshop and you're just like, I am talking to my screen. I feel very alone right now. It's just total crickets. That's okay. We've all had this fear. We've all experienced it. But the most important thing here is just to shift and be comfortable with different styles that might be in your room um, and different energies in your audience. Miggy has such a high energy, right? But not everyone is going to match that and that's okay. It ultimately, when you meet people where they are, you're ultimately just going to create a better, more inclusive workshop that way. So instead, the thing I've learned and still remind myself of is don't take it personal. Just lean into it and meet people where they are. There may be different ways to actually increase the engagement that don't have to be verbal. So some of my favorite tactics to do so are just to straight up remove as much intimidation as possible. So you probably have something in the beginning of your workshop where it's like, you know, Krista's rules of engagement and to really make an inclusive space, but often that might not be enough and it might still create a quiet space. Um, so one thing that I love to do is to use this widget by TK and um, it allows for anonymous voting. So this like really removes this feeling of judgment that might happen of like I'm voting for one thing, but somebody might be voting for another. And so you can see here, let's see, um, you fill out the information, but then you can toggle so that it's anonymous, which is really, really awesome. The other thing I always do is give people space right when we're ideating when we're trying to think big and we're brainstorming that's like what somebody's most vulnerable state um and so giving people dedicated spaces so when i'm using figma i'll create separate uh, pages for each person or if i'm doing a workshop in fig jam i'll create different links for everybody so that they have their own space uh, with themselves or with their teams to uh to ideate um which really helps like uh you know fear of judgment goes down that way um okay so my other tactic for when things are quiet when you might want them to be dynamic dynamic is just to straight up double down on nonverbal collaboration um so miggy was going over and he has this amazing file in the community which i heavily use around like tips for for utilizing the emoji wheel stamps uh i always will have like a little high five zone just to like add in a little quirk into the meetings and make people feel like i'm okay as a facilitator with you all utilizing this as a form of communication with me um the other thing too is um i'm on our community product team uh fun fact and that team is very nonverbal in the way that they collaborate and so it's actually so much fun though in these meetings so we have a bi-monthly team meeting and we do this exercise of like a rosebud thorn or helping hands and we're all silent in the meeting but it's so lively on the file and so it's like we really lean into you know doubling down on this nonverbal collaboration within uh within fig jam and it actually makes her just like i leave that meeting feeling so energized after it uh, we drop in pictures. Um, it's a it's a good time. Flames are flying everywhere. Um, so use Big Jam as your way to to in that moment when you're realizing, oh no, things are quiet, to to just like break that barrier with folks. Okay, but what if the opposite actually happens and someone is super excited, very eager to share, um, and you're just thinking the whole time you know, should I interrupt this person? I don't want to be rude. And I'm here to tell you that it's actually okay to interrupt, especially when you need to balance the space being taken in the room and making sure you're creating an inclusive space for all. But there's a way to do it respectfully, I promise. Um, and so one of the tactics I love to use is just to give them a task. They have a lot of energy. Utilize that in your advantage. Have them help you facilitating this big meeting. Um, so I often will say like, hey, there's a lot of post-its on this board. I think one of the hardest parts of you know facilitation is like live decision making. So having them help you group these different post-its 
you know, label each uh, theme uh, is really, really helpful. Also, like Miggy said, like those action items that come out of the meeting are critical. So if you can have them like help you create that summary, create those notes, um, that will go very far. Um, the other tactic when this situation happens is just to really try and redirect their attention. Um, so you'll see in every single one of my facilitation, uh, like workshop files or meeting, bigger meetings, I'll always have what I call a parking lot. Some folks call it an ice box. And it's really a space just first and foremost that it's important to understand the, the person who's like eager and sharing their ideas that you hear them um, and legitimize what they're actually talking to you about. Um, and so you can say things like cool, like this is a really interesting topic. I don't want to lose sight of it. We are talking through this area over here. I'd love to take five minutes. We can talk through it a little bit more and let's revisit it at the end. I don't want to lose track of it. So I'm going to create a post it and add it to this parking lot here. Um, and this just like really helps say like, I see you, I hear you. And now maybe isn't the time, but I really want to address this later. Um, and then the other is just to revisit those objectives and the ground rules. Like it might feel awkward in the moment, but I always use different breaks as a point to say, hey, everyone, like, let's just go back to those ground rules. Let's like reset for a moment. And so it's not so much of like this feeling that you're pointing fingers at any one person. Um, my other like favorite little back pocket trick is to use body language. Um, this is especially uh, useful when you're in person. Yeah, I do a lot of this or something. No, uh, <laughs> but when you're in person, if you actually stand behind the person who's like a higher converser, it actually redirects the focus a little bit more and they end up kind of slowing down because they'll have to like turn around and like talk to you. Um, or you can go more towards the people who are less conversing and, and kind of make eye contact with them, really try and help engage them in a different way. Um, so that's one of my favorite little back pocket items. Um, okay, going to pan around here. Um, we're going to go to our next scenario, uh, which is stakeholder alignment. It's a fun one, right? Um, but the oh no situation that happens is that the stakeholder doesn't know what you're trying to convey. Um, and so for many of us product folks, we often find ourselves in these, what I call like high stakes meetings or really expensive meetings with our stakeholders and leadership. And your goal is to get alignment on a problem or solution, but there's often not a lot of time to do so. Um, and so sometimes like, I know I personally have left some of these meetings like with my team of, wait, what happened? Did we actually get approval? Like it, nothing really happened. And that is like, probably worse than saying like, no, you can't ship this or no, you can't build this is like the ambiguity of it all. Um, so um, this is like, there's a couple tactics. I'm still very much working on this area. It's a tough one for sure, to say the least. Um, but I've been in a few of these situations where I have a couple tactics that I think are that go far. Um, so I think the most important thing though is just to remember to take a deep breath and to really remember to have empathy for your stakeholders and where everyone is coming from. Um, you and your team have probably been in the weeds thinking through these prob gnarly problems together and coming up with solutions and might have spent months before you actually talk to your stakeholders. They don't have that visibility. So it's really important to, like Miggy was talking earlier, is like having that imperative mood, like really being as direct and, and, and making sure you get those alignments. These stickies are amazing, Miggy. Um, and so this first tactic um, is critical. It's making sure you're making space to get alignment along the way. Um, I think there's a hard balance, right, of saying, Okay, we'll pause for questions at the end, but often then everything gets buried, people get lost, and that's when you might hear your, you know, your leader being like 30 minutes in saying, wait, what's the actual goal of this? That's a not great feeling. Um, so you might want to propose a question after each end of your different section and utilize this um, alignment scale um, and just have just to have a way for people to, to kind of voice their own opinion. And then you get an idea of like, Okay, Miggy, let's see where he, 
Uh, so Miggy is very agreeable on this. And so we know that as we keep going forward with this design, he's not going to be a problem or, you know. Um, the other thing I like to do also shout out to Bursabel who built this. Um, uh, the other thing I like to do is just in the moment, I literally just created two lines in Fig Jam, nothing fancy here, to create a quick two by two. So if you start to hear kind of two different directions as to where people are going, or you want to say like, do you agree that this, um, that this design shows high reward, but also has high risk? And so you can have all of your stakeholders just drop their face literally on where they stand. Um, so these are some really quick and easy tactics to use in the meeting. The other thing I really like to push uh, my teams with is, again, going back to that imperative mood, like asking more specifically and being direct with the feedback you're actually asking for them. Remember, this is a high stakes meeting. You don't have a lot of time. Um, so be specific around what you want for them. And then at the end, you'll be more satisfied with what you get out of it, too. So instead of saying something like, we'd like general feedback on our vision, how does this feel? they are not going to know where to even start with that. So be specific, like, do you align with our framework for how we prioritize our user problems? Um, the other thing I like to drop in is just around like uh, different like uh, frameworks of post-its, if you will, like Mad Lib style. Um, and this also is just shows what type of feedback you're looking for from them. So like, I'm most excited for this, or I want to know more about this, or I wonder if we did this. Um, and so this is also just one template that I and my teams utilize quite often is just like, you know, you know, here, use a stamp, use your post-it, and then again, a little framework of like what specifically you're looking for. So fun meetings to have. Um, okay, the last uh, bucket here uh, is being able to pivot gracefully. Um, and so, uh, what might happen though in the middle of your workshop is attendees want to shift how the workshop is organized. Again, think back, you've created this beautiful narrative art, you've thought through all the problems, the flow of the workshop, but then things are shifting live and in the moment. Um, and so you might be in this kind of state of panic of like, but how will we get through everything? Like I have this agenda, how will we squeeze this in? The PM wants to talk about this or the designer wants to uh, ideate a little bit longer. But the most important thing is to just remember that you're not there to have all the answers as the facilitator. You're there to guide the conversation for the best possible outcome for the team or your group. And so sometimes issues might arise in that meeting that are really important, that need more time to be thought through, and that's okay. Uh, you might run over time, you might have to alter your agenda. It's just important to roll with it and be flexible. The more like anxious you are, or like the more, um, you know, frantic you feel in that moment, they're going to emulate emulate that behavior. So the more like roll with it and the punches, it, I think that's a saying, I don't know, uh, the better. <laughs> this is me being Zen. Um, the other bits, I think as a facilitator, you often think you have to be perfect all the time. That is not true. Um, I really lean on bathroom breaks as your friend. So if you need a moment to like think through how to pivot your agenda, tell everyone to take a five, meet with the PM or whoever your, your close partner is in this workshop to jam on like a quick solution, propose a new agenda with them, make sure it ladders back up to the objectives you set at the beginning of the meeting. Um, I did a workshop with our community team. We got to be in person. It was like our only workshop in person and it was lovely, but I created these lovely, I printed out all, all these agendas uh, and they got totally ripped apart, shredded. You know, we changed a lot of things because we were so ingrained in the context that we needed before going into ideating. And we really needed to better understand all of these are problems. So we all agreed that we wanted to shift our time there. Um, but you better believe I had everyone take a quick five uh, while I thought through the agenda. Um, the other uh, bit here is the beauty of doing it in Fig Jam or online is just making sure that you label all of your different um, like uh, topics that you're going to come over, go over with the timestamps. This makes math in the moment a lot easier when you need to adjust it. And it just also helps you keep yourself accountable plus the timer to making sure you're, you're staying to time. Um, so yeah, let's see. 
moving on down just to wrap things up um just remember that the more prepared you are with these different alternative paths so having these little tactics i've gone through in your back pocket the easier in the moment it will be to pivot um, so remember, lean into those nonverbal uh, engagements, uh, meet folks where their energy is. Don't expect everyone to be at your level of energy um, and have this, I'm calling now, I'm coining this my term, altitude empathy for your stakeholders. Um, so align with them along the way, instead of just relying on these like half head nods of agreement, like mark it down, like really talk through it together. Um, it'll be worth everyone's while in that way. Um, the last one being uh, completing the entire workshop is not a sign of success. Find value for the group. You're there to facilitate the conversation. Um, so again, there's no one right out of the box solution here to handle any of these new situations. It's all about how you adapt and show humility in the moment. So embrace unintentional outcomes. Um, and that's all. Oh, little Q&A. Great. Let's dive into that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Krista. That was amazing. All right. So I believe I, I think this is that we have questions here mm -hmm. that have been prepared for us. Um, do you want to start or should I? Yeah, I can start with this one, though. What do you think is uh, the ideal workshop length for stakeholders and leadership? Um, I think about these two maybe a little different. So. Um, if I if we're going in as a team for something a little bit more tactical, like let's say a product review um, or a, a solution review, a design review, I think, you know, if you can get it in in an hour, that's great. Um, it's really hard to get that time with leadership. My big push is that that shouldn't be the first time that you're meeting with them. Uh, you should be talking. This shouldn't be the first time that they're seeing that. So that's why that amount of time could be less. Um, when I think about like a, a design spike or design sprint workshop, being remote has changed this quite a bit. Um, I think when I first started, um, you know, more, mainly remote, I was like, okay, all day workshops, because that's what I was used to. No, that is staring at your screen, trying to think creatively, like for an hour is really hard to ask people to do. Um, so I really break those up into like half days um, across a few days. Um, so. Hope that answers. You want to take cool. one, Maggie? Yeah, yeah, I'll take one. I, I I like this one right here, where it's like, any tips for easily getting hand drawn sketches into Fig Jam during workshops? What I would say with that is that it doesn't need to be perfect to articulate the intention. Um, so I understand that people might be uncomfortable using a mouse, but what you can do is set an expectation for the fidelity required to communicate an idea. Um, so a couple of quick tips with that, you can press the shift key and actually draw nice straight lines. So even if the person just wants to like, you know, sketch out like a little wireframe, you know, you could just easily start to sketch out those ideas plainly. So as I mentioned, before you want to model the behavior that your audience is, is kind of that you want them to do you know so even like a little squiggle sometimes having an activity i believe we have the the drawing a llama activity you know helps people get comfortable and and feel more comfortable with that space so like let people know that it isn't required to have a tablet and to kind of like find some of that innate creativity and embrace mm -hmm you know, embrace the mess. Like yeah. it doesn't need to be perfect to, to convey the, the appropriate mood. One, um, I'll just add to that one thing too, you know, to not everyone has access to a tablet or feels comfortable or even like utilizing this pen. I, you don't want to see me trying to draw with this, um, is I'll also just give the option if people want to use, you know, old school pen and paper, that's just fine, whatever works for them. And then I'll leave spaces in the file and time, I allot the time for people to upload and to just put their um, put their image right straight up into the, the FigJam file too. Cool. 
Um, oh, and there is a there yeah. is an iPad app. There is an iPad yes. app for Fig for Fig Jam. So like you know, I know they might they might be comfortable using their fingers. And and another thing that we've been exploring too as well is uh, you can totally use it on a Chromebook. And many Chromebooks have like touch screens. So even if it's like a finger painting session. So I know that if you're like in 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 like a high school space and your students have a, a Chromebook, you know, it can be like a finger drawing a, a activity. So just just set that expectation. Let them do what they need to do and even if they just want to use shapes and stickers let them use shapes and stickers um i love that um okay i'm going to tackle this one how do you approach going from i need understanding about the thing from these people to these are the specific activities i'm choosing to do with them um, I've heard it described as know what answers you're looking to find how do you typically think about picking and planning workshop activities I love this question um, so I'm pretty embedded into my team so I'm kind of have that advantage of kind of like uh, being a little bit one step ahead because I know what they're thinking and what problems we're looking to answer. Um, but I think it's really just in general critical to meet with your team of like, OK, I'm hearing um, that there is a block in your design thinking, like, how do we get you out of this rut or how do we get more ideas like so that you can like riff off of those with the designers I'm working with. And so then it's a matter of like meeting with your 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 colleagues understanding what they're hoping to get out of this and then you can mimic based off of those uh, what their needs are um, so something like um I'm trying to think of an example here um i think in general just like a designer right if they're feeling a little stuck they want to make sure they're including all other designers in different areas across the org um, then it's a matter of, okay, let's make sure they're all around for, they understand what we're trying to actually solve for. So there will always be like an insights portion, whether that's data, whether that's research, you know, whether that's different tweets that we've collected along the way. And then so that everybody in the room has an idea of, okay, these are the problems we're solving for. And then I like to also just use like, how might we statements to help generate those uh, different solutions. Um, so starting with just like written how might we's and then going into ideating uh, with drawings. Um, so yeah, I think it's just like really important to like get grounded with your with your team on what they're hoping to get out of this, what they're blocked on. Um, and then when you have a proposed agenda, like do share that before you actually kick start your your workshop. Um, it's important to get their their thoughts on it. Anything to add there, Maggie? Yeah, so like, I mean, I don't know if you brought this up because I was drawing Gogu with like a dark saber, but um, <laughs> what I like to do, and and this is something that we've done here, like at, at Figma as well, is like you know, like you you start at the end and you kind of like work backwards, you know. So like you know, going back to like my whole notion of the story, you know, like use the notion of like a peak end rule. Like people typically remember like the peak and the end. So when we were working and brainstorming uh, Fig Jam features, like even the Delighter features, like the high fives, uh, the emojis. Basically, we started with tweets, right? Like what was the final tweet yeah. that somebody might share when they discovered the sort of like delightful feature? So if we wanted to think about the moment of delight, you know, we started, we, we started from the end where someone already discovered the feature, we drew it right and, and and many incarnations on on what they might actually say and then kind of like move back from that so um typically think about what it is that you're trying to accomplish i i, I brought up the design of storytelling book by ellen lupton i mean there's that, that book is packed with like basically just activities and storytelling activities and and i think that that's just a really good way to start and there's a lot of different methods yeah. for kind of like dissecting and and kind of yielding um you know, like good ideas. And, and it's just a matter of like, really creating a, a way to make people feel creative, right? Yeah. And, and, and speaking the language that they might speak. So, you know, if you have a project manager or like a product manager, like in the file, you know, they might have a slightly different language or they might pay attention to different things. So, you know, they knew that we were all like Twitter obsessed. So like, let's, you know, look at that, that, that tweet, and then kind of reel back from there. So what's important to the people that you're running the workshop with and, and speak their language and start at the end and, and move backwards, because sometimes that's, that's the way that you need to tell that story. Um, 
Yeah. Oh, one more thing I'll add. This is clear, clearly one of my favorite areas uh, to discuss um, is I think for a lot of folks, it is uncomfortable to have like more of that blue sky thinking. And so when you're like, let's generate as many ideas as possible that like immediately will shut people down and they're like, I'm very nervous. A lot of folks are more on the like execution side of things. And so one tactic I like to use in that situation is I think it was Airbnb kind of coined this exercise, but it's the 11 star experience. Um, and so it, it helps ramp up to that like crazy idea. Um, so Airbnb's example is like, um, you know, the the three star experience is you show up to your Airbnb and you're able to unlock the door, but the sheets are dirty. Um, the 11 star experience would be like Elon Musk is at your door and you're being launched to the moon as your like Airbnb experience. And so by like ramping people up, they start to like iteratively get to that like blue sky thinking. Um, so anywho, <laughs> um, which one do you want to take next, Maggie? All right, here, let's see. Um, given time is a super valuable commodity, how do you balance novice Fig Jam users versus more experienced? Instructions in the file is amazing and love them. I share them ahead of the time, uh, but interested to hear how much time is set aside in the meeting to cover those. So I think, you know, like I, I spoke in the beginning to like understanding the user's needs. So having a clear idea of who your audience is important. I often will give workshops to individuals who will have varying degrees of expertise uh, in something like FigJam or Figma. And I will just run kind of like a litmus test in the beginning to kind of see where people are at and, and, and provide that padding to like make an adjustment. So I would even do something. So Chrissy, you want to follow me in the file? Oh, just, yeah. just go ahead and click on my icon uh there i am boom right there yeah all right so like you know and and I, I know there was an alignment scale that was pretty pretty shared earlier but you know something as simple as you know dropping in you know like a circle other circle last circle you know changing that color and and like just kind of like letting people know drawing a line right so just getting you know super regular with it and if i need to send this to the back i'm gonna hit command left bracket or the left bracket key, no, sorry, not left command left bracket. What am I doing? So I would actually just go in here and then just like set up that scale and then tell people to drop a sticker. Like, where are you at? You know, are you an experienced user? Are you less experienced? And then managing that is just having check-ins, right? So when you have people that are more experienced, you're gonna see them. Like when you're facilitating a virtual whiteboard, that's the benefit of it is you will see people engaging in the activity. So whether you have like five people in the call or like 20 or 30 people on the call, you know, it can be a little bit difficult to sort of like manage that. Over time, you'll get a little bit better, but you know, have those check-ins, provide that space, ask if people need accommodation so then that way they're able to like work, work as best as possible. Um, you don't need to move through the whole thing like a robot, you know, make sure that uh, people feel heard and that they feel kind of like safe to do what they need to do. Um, usually have them only do one thing at a time, right? I think that that is key. Having people do one thing at a time is, is the way to give them the space to kind of like accomplish that thing. Uh, giving them too many instructions, giving them ambiguous instructions. Like I have a lot of comfort in Fig Jam and I've been on a lot of Zoom meetings, but still there's times when I'm in there like, what are we doing now? You know, and you're almost like afraid to be like, hey, I don't know exactly what we're doing or where we're at. You're the um, Ono situation. <laughs> yeah, like I, I would be like the Ono situation. and. And, you know, it's like, I know how to use Fig Jam really well, um, but that that doesn't matter at that point. It's like, you know, is my is my attention, you know, there? And you have to realize that everybody's going to be all, all over the place with their ability to be constantly present. Um, so having in those check-ins, providing that space, and then having them only do one thing at a time. Don't tell them that, oh, 
do these four things now, you know, just have them work and focus on that one thing. Another thing I want to, 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 to cover is even think about your audience. Like what is the asynchronous experience like? Um, so if you are not there as a facilitator, or even if you are there just as a reviewer, let's say you're out that week and you need to get caught up, you know, what does this space look like for them? Are they then able to, uh, provide their input, engage, leave comments. Um, so these are all things that you need to think about. So yeah, it's it's going to be about leaving questions, but it's going to be about curating that space. And that's why I always think of it as like a user experience issue. So if you are a designer, you know, like how are you helping people with the issues that they may have? And then also just continue to grow your process over time. It's a learning experience. You know, we're all beginning to to become a little bit more mature with how we collaborate in these virtual spaces with tools like infinite canvases um, so we are as a whole going to start to develop better practices uh, so it's just you know be mindful and adapt your practice have a, a recap on how the presentation went and even ask individuals how that might be better. Um, one thing that I do with my workshops is I'll send out a form and say, hey, did this work for you? Uh, one of my first workshops was pretty chaotic. You know, I led them all over the place and people were like, yeah, I got a little lost. So I'm like, what can I do to make that a little bit better? I didn't get insulted. I just took it seriously, you know, so take that feedback and, and implement it um, because it's it's still new. I mean, Fig Jam is a product is still developing. Uh, so there there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to and, and, and you're just going to learn so much just by doing, you know, so don't get caught up in trying to run the best workshop. Uh, just run a workshop. You'll just <laughs> learn so much from doing that. And then just remember, OK, for the next time, it probably will go different. Um, and, and don't get dissuaded by, you know, if it doesn't go well, just take it as a learning experience. Amazing. Um, I think we have like, a, we have time for a couple more. Um, I want, I think this, uh, do we all do, do either of us have recommended trainings out there on running a workshop or facilitation? We can probably give a list at the end. I'm not good at on the fly, top of mind. Um, but I've been uh, blessed to be trained by um, two amazing facilitators. Um, so if you have other facilitators um, at your company that you feel like are uh, really good or you admire, just like ask to observe them, even if you're not part of the work. Um, so yeah, Beth Tolan and, and Kristen Torrey here at Figma are like incredible. Um, Kristen actually led a big workshop at our last config, and that is a recording on YouTube, so I can also share that after. Um, the other, yeah, I was trying to think what else. Any? Do you have any off the top of your head, Miggy? Um, I, I, I missed that. I was doing another little thing in the file. Can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> um, do you have any recommended trainings on running a workshop facilitation? That I don't know yet, but okay. oftentimes I find inspiration in very different spaces. So if, like I mentioned before, if I'm learning, if I'm thinking about running a workshop, I'm not going to just look at how people run workshops. I'm going to look at like how people tell stories, Yeah, yeah. you know, so like, um, I'm, 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 I, I, I like looking at those, 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 those off kilter inspirations. So like, you know, I, I was talking to two presenters yesterday. There's a, there's a, this is a Frank video on, um, preparing for a presentation yeah. and, and it's just very inspiring. It's like so old now it's from like the early two thousands, but I will watch that video before I give a talk just to, to get a really good sense that, you know, I'm going to give a presentation the way that I'm giving a presentation and it doesn't have to be the way that other people give presentations and that's okay. Yeah, actually that inspires me of thinking, uh, thinking outside of just like a workshop facilitation class is like go take an improv class. That is probably one of the best tricks to do um, to, to set yourself up for like just being in that ambiguity because those are the things you're going to have to be most prepared for. Um, and I listen, before I do research sessions, I watch different interviews on like Bravo, or I listen to podcasts just to try and see how other people in very different fields are thinking about asking questions. So I love that tip, Maggie. 
Um, cool. So yeah. um, do we want to, oh, actually one thing, can I just share one thing with my screen really quick? Uh, please, I'll stop sharing. All right, no you worries. You want to take over? Yeah, here, let's see if it'll let me, uh, let me grab my right window. Is this my window? Yeah. Okay, cool. So the one thing that I wanted to identify, like we were talking about just kind of bringing everybody up to speed. And I saw a comment where they bring someone in a file and then they're like a better expert. Um, two quick things that really helped me out a lot that like I really didn't discuss quite yet. Uh, command forward slash or command P. Uh, for like uh, for like international keyboards when you press that you get this quick actions menu so if you're looking for something right so if I type in sticky it pulls up sticky note if I want to save diversion history you might even find shortcuts that you're just unaware of right you're going to find yeah. features and basically they're all kind of tucked away in this menu um, and but my favorite is command forward slash and typing in keyboard shortcuts so I can hop in here and I can oh find gosh. some like easy keyboard shortcuts. This is the same as it is in Figma. Um, I think there's like one error. I'm not going to like highlight which one that is just yet. But, you know, here, like bring forward, send a backward, bring to front, send a back, right? Grouping selection. So like if you want to become more of an expert facilitator, you can use those keyboard shortcuts. Um, so and then and then I'm going to start to wrap this up. I want to remind everybody that Config is coming up. Config is a, a the global design conference, and that is going to be truly global this year. Uh, so config.figma.com. Uh, Vanessa, when is it going to be again this year? Is it May tenth? May tenth. May tenth and eleventh. So it's going to be May tenth and eleventh. Registration opens April. <laughs> Fifth. So here we go. Registration opens April 5th. Uh, so make sure that you come and check it out. And I got one last request to, to repeat that keyboard shortcut, uh, command P or command forward slash. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Command forward slash. And it brings up my, my keyboard shortcuts there. Amazing. or command P and you can also right click uh, to find like a number of different things and also all of those uh, menu options uh, I think I like hid my UI let me show hide my UI there we go all of those options can be found over here as well so you'll see the quick actions menu it'll be highlighted and then there you go you can pull that up so config.figma.com if you enjoyed this you Wow, we have so much in store for you. So uh, May 10th and 11th, uh, come and check it out. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Krista. This was Thank amazing. You. Thank you, this Vanessa. Is so fun. And, 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 and all the Figmates that joined us in the file today. Uh, we will be making this community file available after the talk. We will email that out to you all. Uh, keep out uh, an eye out for the YouTube video as well. Um, once again, you know, we appreciate you and, and, and the community is the reason that we love just doing these videos. So continue to be active, do those things, ask those questions. Uh, and thank you all for joining. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day or evening.